Evening, Manchester City lost the game. Wow, headlines all over the world. Yeah, well, obviously it was a tough one at Liverpool. They went down 4-3. Great entertainment, the sort of thing we've come to expect from City. There's lots to talk about in that area. There's also the the rumbling on Alexis Sanchez story, which we're not going to labour, but we will talk about because it's still current, I suppose. Uh, but the latest seems to be that City have pulled out of that deal. And you just heard in the headlines there, it's far from done from a United perspective. Uh, or pre- maybe even Chelsea come into the affray, I don't know. But Paul Dickoff, the legend that is Paul Dickoff, is sat alongside me. Uh, Paul, obviously it's been a very talked about subject by everybody and his dog. I, I can't help looking at it from a City perspective and think... They haven't been pushed into an auction and ridiculous money. They've stuck to the principles. And whilst I accept that Alexis Sanchez is a great player who would have been a great addition to City's squad, they've took a stand, I think, and... and and it feels like the right thing has, has happened, that they've withdrawn from it. How, how do you see? You might completely disagree with me. No, nah, I never disagree with you, Cheesy, you know that. <laughs> um, there's a couple of points in this for me, and the first major one is what you're talking about. Um, you know, you said it there, every man and his dog, from the summer till now, or till a couple of days ago, um, we're expecting Alexis Sanchez to be a Man City player, if not in January, but um, come the summer. Um, obviously, the goalposts have changed quite dramatically since then. Um and I think the club have got to take a lot of credit, without a shadow of a doubt. And look, it hurts me to say it, I think Man United have done very well as well. They're making a statement of intent um, by going for a, a very, very good player, and that's what he is. But, you know, um, we know how humble our owners are. We know how humble our manager is. Um, and every everybody talks outside Man City about, oh, we buy the league, we buy the best players. The reason we're getting success under Pep is because the money we've sent. And they've made a huge stand on this. You know, they've turned around and they went, look, a player with four and a half months left in his contract or four and a half months left of the season is going to cost us more money than what he would have done in the summer. Um, a lot more money as well. Um, reading between the lines, it looks as if uh, everything was agreed. Um, you know, I think Sanchez openly admitted when he was away with Chile last summer that he was expecting to come and sign because the deal was done. Um, and whether it be the agents, whether it be other clubs coming in with more money, the club have went, well, no. You know, this is a player that's 29 years old. Yes, he's a fantastic player. Whoever signs him uh, are going to get a fantastic player. But is the need for Manchester City to have a player of his um, of his type, if anything else, when you've got Sergio Aguero, when you've got Leroy Sané, when you've got Raheem Sterling, when you've got Kevin De Bruyne, when you've got David Silva? You know, the names just roll off the tongue. Yes, no secret the club would have wanted him, but... They have sent a message out to everybody. Yeah, we might be the, one of the richest clubs in the world, but nobody is going to help, hold us to ransom regardless who you are. Um, and I think that will um, th- that'll show a lot of clubs that we're not there to be bullied when it purely comes down to money. Because, look, if Manchester City wanted to sign Alexis Sanchez now, if they really wanted to sign him, they would go and do it. Um, but in doing this, they're making a stand, not just to players, not just to clubs, but more importantly to agents trying to get players into the club. Yeah, and, and there'll be people listening, particularly in non-City fans, and who will say, you know, football isn't moral. Football, you know, it, it does pay obscene wages, etc. So we're, we're accepting that, and we're also accepting, I am anyway, that footballers, to a certain extent, are all mercenaries. Of course, they will go where the highest wages are. But this is still feels to me like a Pep Guardiola principle, and, uh, you know, doing things the right way. And, and you know... And the, the number chairman of, and the owner. Yeah, well. absolutely. The whole, and Chiki Bagaristan is sort of the, the four of them, you, really. It just shows you that the hierarchy at the club are all singing off the same sheet. And how many top clubs, how many football clubs can say that? From the owner to the chairman to the chief exec to the director of football and to the manager. There's not many clubs that can say that. And if a player who has a relationship, clearly he does with Pep Guardiola, who's given presumably what was a gentleman's promise, and it sounds like the, the deal was nearly done in August... And then when he gets to this stage, suddenly his head is turned. You don't want that player in your club, do you? Um, I'll go back to the conversation we had a few weeks ago about would, um, I think Rodney Marsh came on and was talking about it and we were saying about would he upset the dynamics within the squad. And at the time I said if Pep Guardiola, who without doubt is one of the best, if not the best coaches, managers in the world, would think that for one minute he wouldn't do it. If he thought he was going to come in and complement the dynamics they've got, because the one thing Manchester City have got, as much as the quality that they've got, as much as the results they've been getting, as much as them run the way of the league at the minute, they've got a fantastic team spirit there. Um, from the players to the staff to the fans, everybody's together. 
and maybe this extra money, the extra wages, thinking everything's been done, has made Pep, the owners, nobody else go, hang on a minute, if we do this, this guy might come in and upset a few of our players who have been brilliant for us all season, and let's not get away from that. You know, we're 12 points clear. 12 points clear with the players we've got. So that's the couple of things I'm saying. The need for Sanchez to come in now and to spend the money and upset the dynamics is the two reasons why. And to full credit to the club as always, that that's why they've made this decision at the minute. Now, you want to contribute to the uh, <clears throat> to the debate, 0345 treble 17625. Later on, we're going to be speaking to Andy Morrison. Stuart Brennan from the Evening News will be chatting to us very soon as well. And Lee Croft, who I bumped into... Uh, at the et- at the little mini Etihad the other night. Played with Crofty and managed them as well. Yeah. Both was an experienced trust. <laughs> we, we could go into that a bit <laughs> later on then. Now, Stuart Brennan is the chief uh, Manchester City correspondent for the Manchester Evening News, So, uh, and I talk to Stuart a lot, and I know he's right across all these stories. Obviously, the, the Alexis Sanchez um, uh, escapade is sort of finished from a City perspective now, but what has been the timeline in, in your mind? You'll have looked at this in a lot of detail, Stuart, what, what, was City really close to getting him? I think City were confident they had him. Uh, to, well, as confident as you can be in these things. Uh, obviously, the interest was, first of all, last summer, uh, when a £60 million deal was lined up. Um, it was all ready to go. They, they, they agreed personal terms with Sanchez. Arsenal had agreed the £60 million fee with a proviso that they, they wanted a replacement before they would let him go. Uh, they had Thomas Lamar lined up from Monaco. That fell through. So Arsenal put the blocks on it and said no. So of course Sanchez stayed. Uh, I know City thought that was a major error on their part because, it, uh, you know, £60 million for a player with a year left in his contract is a, is a huge whack. Uh, and I knew City, City thought they could come back come back in for him either in January or the following summer where they could get him for nothing. Um I, I know for a fact um, from very good source um, that last month they were quite happy uh, just to let it go until next summer and get him for free. Obviously everything was going well, the top scorers in Europe, Aguero was going well, Jesus had scored a few goals and got a little bit of flat but you expect that with young lads. So there wasn't a problem, you know, everything was going great and they thought why, why do we need Sanchez now? I'm going to spend money on him when we can get him for nothing next summer. And that was that was a, the, the uh, that was a, the policy. That was a strategy. Uh, but then, of course, Gabriel Jesus got injured on New Year's Eve down at Crystal Palace, and it changed. That changed everything because they didn't know at that point uh, how long he was going to be out. There were a few fears that he might be a bit longer. Uh, and it also brought it home to them that if they do get an injury, they are a little bit short. If you've got you know, one striker and he's not in form, or he gets an injury or a suspension or whatever, well, you know, then you've got a problem. So they then decided, right, we will go for Sanchez, but we're not going to go big on it because we know he wants to come to us. This is the other factor that Sanchez had expressed all, of, all, all the way along last summer and again, when they'd been in contact with his agent uh, in recent times, he was desperate to play for Pep Guardiola, desperate to play for City, and obviously, he had, you know, great chance of winning trophies this this season with them if, if he came in January. Um, so they thought we, we we can get him, but we're not going to spend. You know, we, we've got the personal terms are already agreed. That isn't a problem. Um, we'll go to Arsenal. We'll offer them twenty million pound. Take it or leave it. And, uh, you know, if they've got any sense, they'll take it because there were, there were reasons to confident that Sanchez wanted to play for City. And the other provider, I mean, I must stress this because this was said to me by a very high level City source last, last month. Um, he said, you know, basically, we've got an agreement with a player from, from last summer. Uh, he's told us how desperate he is to play for us. And that's great. That's exactly what we want. If he walks away from this now, well, to be honest, we don't really want him anyway, and Pep won't want him because Pep, you know, Pep's life. He, you know, he wants players who are passionate about what they do, and he wants people who are passionate playing for him, playing for playing for City. Uh, and if somebody sort of starts umming and ahhing about a deal that's already in place, well, stuff it. You know, you can forget it. Uh, so they went back in. They offered Arsenal twenty million pound. Arsenal then tried to drum up. Um, as much interest as they could uh, and United were the obvious uh, contenders in terms of, of City we knew Mourinho 
like Sanchez, and they're also keen to keep him out of City's clutches. Uh, and United, they, they negotiated a deal with United, um, which was a lot higher in terms of his salary and also in terms of the, the fee. I think the fee, the, the fee originally was thirty-five million. I'm not sure exactly what it is now that they're proposing, but it's, it's uh, Mkhitaryan plus money. Um, which would take it above the £60 million pound that City were going to pay last summer. You know, if you, if you put Mkhitaryan down as a £30 million pound player, which he was, it will be £30 million pound plus £30-odd million. Pound. And, you know, this is for a player with six months in his contract, which City, City, City thought, and I agree with them, is complete madness. So you think then City, City come out of this in a, in a good light then, Stu? Uh, yes. Yes, in terms of it, was, it became down a point of principle. Um, the agent started demanding a, a big fee for himself. Um, he started demanding it was all, it was over fifty percent more for Sanchez than Sanchez had already agreed to take last summer. Uh, they suddenly and then they're saying, "Well, United are going to give us this. You, you know, this is what United are giving us." So you have to and. City was saying, well, hold on a minute, we had an agreement with a player, he said he was desperate to play for us, what happened to his desperation to play for us? Now it's all about the money, now it's all about the, the agent's fee. You want to say something, Paul? Because that's, that's, we've it's just really made it all, mate. Yeah. We were nearly finished the radio show, Stuart, how are you doing, mate? You okay? <laughs> Sorry about that. It is, it, is, it is quite an involved one, though, Paul, you know what it's like. Well, you no, know, a great insight, though, thank <laughs> you. I know you were at a press conference last week, and, and you would have been as well, Stuart. I actually thought, I mean, you think we're playing Liverpool, one of our biggest games of the season. I thought the fact that Pep spoke about Gabriel Jesus not being too far away planted a little seed and sent a lot of messages out to people. You know, yeah. because maybe before that there was the threat of Jesus is out for a long time. Mm -hmm. The need for Sanchez is more now. Um, and rather than talking about the game, he spoke a lot about, about Gabby coming back very, very soon. And I thought he planted a little seed to a lot of people yes. on that one. And I think maybe then... Without Andy saying that they knew that something, something was mummering behind the scenes, and I thought it was very clever of Pep to do that. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I mean, there's been stuff, all kinds of stuff planted. I mean, we, we were getting a story a week ago that, that Sanchez um, is desperate to leave Arsenal now, above anything else, above wanting to play for City or where, he, where his destination is. He was desperate to leave Arsenal, and he would go anywhere pretty much to get out of Arsenal because. The relationship has turned sour, which is understandable given what's been going on. Uh, so that one was coming out of Arsenal, and again, that, that's to put pressure on City, saying you know he, he's not necessarily going to come to you. He's more interested in getting out of Arsenal than actually coming to you now. So there's all there's lots of little things like that going on all the time. But yeah, you, you're dead right, Paul. I mean, that was uh, that was was a signal from from uh, from Pep that you know. Jesus is coming back. We're not desperate. Um, we we wait until summer if, uh, if if we need to and get into nothing. And that, again, that, that tries to put the pressure back on Arsenal. But it looks like it looks to me like he is uh, he's going to go to United. But again, you I never wouldn't. Know. You never ever know. Stu, thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate that. Stuart Brennan from the Manchester Evening News. You can see why he's the chief Manchester City correspondent all across it, <clears throat> and even. The little twist at the end, you know, you never know until the, the page is signed. Let's, let's move on to Andy Morrison now, who uh, was trying to keep a low profile at Anfield on uh, Sunday. He had his flat cap on, and somebody said to me, he's in the away end, but he's against the wall. I think I walked past him twice and never saw him. That's because he was the wall. How are you, Andy? Hiya, Tiki, you're right, pal. I'm good, how you yourself? Yeah. Yeah, good, mate, good. Let, let, let me ask you about the game, because we've talked enough about Sanchez now. What, what did you make of the game, Andy? Um, it was, you know, it, it, it just turned on a six-minute period, really. Um, the, you know, Otamendi hits a crossbar, and we look like we're the team that are going to go and win the game. And then, you know, then we get done um, on the sucker punch. You know, I just think John Stone's got himself into a bad position. You know, he's not deep enough, really, when the ball's... Somebody's running at him from midfield and slips that ball. You know, he has to be a little bit deeper and be able to see the man. Um, and then once that goes in, you know, they get the, the next goal very quickly and it's game over, you know, or, or it centres that way. And um, and it's very hard to come back from that, especially with that atmosphere and the tempo and the intensity that Liverpool played at. Very, very difficult. So, you know, it was... Uh, it just shows, you know, it doesn't matter what, what games you are, you cannot drop 
drop down 10, 15%. You know, the first goal to a passive um, tackle from Fabian Delft. It's not aggressive enough in that area of the pitch. And, and, he, and Chamberlain gets away and gets a shot off, you know. So defensively, there was a lot of poor things, um, which we haven't been this season because we haven't really had many questions asked of us. But, um, you know, that, that was probably the most disappointing thing for me. Andy, just on the, the John Stones one with Firmino, which was a huge goal, not that we're advocating it at all, do you think if he'd went down that he would have got a foul for it? Possibly, if he'd been really clever. Nowadays. But he was too honest. I think he was yeah. more worried about giving the penalty away. Absolutely. Um, because he just got himself into a bad position. And if I'm over-aggressive here now, um, then I'll give a penalty away. So the lesser of the two evils is to let him get a shot off. But the finish was was, was incredible. It was, it was. But um, yeah, if he was a little bit cuter, you know, what he probably would be a little bit cuter. And, and that's, that's probably to do with him coming back after being out for a couple of months because you know it was at the Watford game when he got done with a ball over the top and the, and the keeper bailed him out and then again um, Bristol City there was a couple of times he got into bad positions you know and, and that's you know he's still a young defender you know and he, he, once he gets you know eight ten games under his belt again after his injury layoff you know you'll probably find that sharpness again because it's not about your fitness levels and your sprint times and all that it's about your mental um, awareness on the pitch of what's around you you know and, and that sometimes takes a little bit longer to come back than, than actually the legs One of the things I observed about that game and I know we, you and I were both behind that goal watching the defence but when you look at the bigger picture City's form of defence is attack I know that sounds very uh, cliched and very simple and I know it's not that simple but it's all about keeping possession having the ball in the other team's half and just picking off the odd counter-attack so for the first time really probably this season we saw concerted pressure on Stones Otamendi you know Delft got an injury and Kyle Walker um, and, and even Fernandinho who I thought had a slightly off game for his standards because he's been absolutely exemplary this season but even they gave the ball away is there any fear at the back of your mind and I don't want to sort of suggest that City now suddenly have gone from being this brilliant team to being vulnerable but that in the latter stages of the Champions League in a in let's say the League Cup final and they played Chelsea that it's gonna that that when they put a little bit under pressure that this defence is is vulnerable yeah, well, I think any defence it doesn't matter what quality of defender you've got if they're if they're exposed and people are running at them you know it doesn't matter how good you are you're gonna you're gonna give opportunities to the opposition you know it is about that first press with City um, you know, once Ferrandino gets booked then you know he's incredible his awareness of reading situations of balls coming out of the box and even if he doesn't actually make the tackle he'll force them square he doesn't allow them to make a forward pass once he gets booked then he's in all sorts of trouble because he, his game just you know completely changes same with Otamendi Otamendi is very aggressive on the first ball he always wants to go and win it but once they get booked them kind of players it makes it difficult so then we start going backwards and start inviting the opposition onto us a little bit more, and and, and Liverpool show that you know they they have got world class players in there that caused us problems. I still think it's a, a false reflection of the game. The score, um, you know, they just hit us in that little period, which they've done a few times this season. And apart from that, there was never much in the game. Um, but you know, just as you said already, the, you know, in the show, there's there's probably three or four people that were just slightly off their, their A game and, and I guess in a, in a huge game like that you can't afford to be Andy thanks very much uh, we'll talk to you again soon right Lee Croft I saw at the under 23 game last week um, and he's obviously uh, been watching the game at the weekend what did you think of it Lee? Uh, yeah it was, it, was, it was a good game to be fair but obviously not the uh, not the result that City were after one of your starring moments was against Liverpool, wasn't it? The, 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 I've, got a, I've got a picture at home signed by you and uh, Christmas's brother, Kiki Masampa, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and your crossover and Kiki scored the goal. One of your highlights uh, yeah, against Liverpool. Yeah, definitely one of my highlights. Yeah, I think it was... I think it was one of my first uh, appearances under Stuart Pearce, that was. Um, and then he brought me on. I think he brought me and Brad Wright Phillips on uh, um, towards the end of the game and uh, linked up with him down the right and put the ball in and, K- and Kiki put it away, yeah. Now, I've got Paul Dick off here, who's got, who's been telling me some stories about you off air. So <laughs> who knows what he's going to say now. How are you, buddy? <laughs> I'm good, Dickie. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. 
Go on, tell us a story about him. <laughs> tell you a story about Crofty. I don't think there's any I could tell at 6.52 on a Tuesday, on a Tuesday evening. What do you think, mate? Uh, I, I think I'd have to agree about stories about you as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that look, played, ended up managing him, where he was brilliant for me as well. We had some good fun, mate, didn't we? You did. You got. We had a really good team, but we just never. I don't know. For some reason, it just never. We had <laughs> the team we had. Looking back now, was was a, a team that should have been up at the top end of the championship, uh, the League One, really, wasn't it? It was, mate. What a good talking about Liverpool game. That was a great day, wasn't it? The old one when we beat them. Oh yeah, oh, what a day that was. Yeah, and then that was. Um, I don't know. I don't know how we did that, really. That was, that was the manager, of course, mate. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> Come on, Crofty. Definitely, definitely the gaffer. <laughs> We're talking all the athletic here. Let's bring it back on topic. Let's talk about City. What did you think of the game at Anfield this Sunday, Lee? Um, I thought I'd. I thought obviously City weren't at the best, um, and I thought Liverpool played really well, which I think uh, both factors uh, affected the result. Really. Thanks very much, Crofty. Uh, that was Lee Croft.